One of the things that's interesting about the sector specifically, I think, is um, that uh, you know there's some big uh, macroeconomic um, fundamentals taking place there around telecoms and the, the ch and the convergence of telecoms and media assets, and we're looking at the way cloud, big data, and so on is impacting on businesses. There's more to go there where enterprises are moving to uh, cloud-based applications. So there's some big um, drivers around consolidation and M&A opportunity. And then, um, again, there are lots of smaller and medium-sized enterprises in the European market, um, which means that it's fertile for consolidation for people to build a platform asset and to do bolt-on acquisitions and to get a business to some sort of scale. In what I deal with, which is primarily advising venture-backed growth stage businesses, um, a lot of the mature assets in, in the venture portfolios are in the consumer internet space. A lot of those assets are now at reasonably substantial scale. The growth rates are good, but they're not in the hundreds of percents, and those businesses need to think about consolidating to get to IPO scale. So your typical American buyer now, talking about the bigger buyers like the Googles of the world, the Google, Facebook, Amazons of the world, they generally tend to go down in the following order, which is people first, then it's product, then it's IP, then it's technology, and actually finally comes market share slash financials. That's typically the way the bigger buyers tend to look at assets from an M&A perspective. European buyers, I find, generally tend to go at the, exactly the other way around. They tend to be much more financial in their thought process. They look at market share or financial metrics. And then people issues are typically, you know, I would almost say it's at the bottom of the, you know, uh, of the list of you know, criteria that they're looking at from an M&A perspective. Asian buyers are the interesting ones. They tend to be initially much more value conscious but they also are willing to take much bigger and longer term bets because they need to, because a lot of them are now sitting on a lot of cash and they're also sitting on very large valuations. I think particularly in the technology space where entrepreneurs and management teams have aspirations to sell to the big technology majors, a lot of the transactions, particularly in the UK mid-market, are not going to be of the right scale to appeal to those. So I think a private equity investor can emphasize their role as an intermediate step, supporting growth ready for an exit to one of the much larger groups. When we're looking at due diligence on a target business, we focus on the people and the IP and the, and the customer contract base. So they're three of the principal areas that we will, we will look at as risk factors when we're acting for buyers. You've got some of the regulatory issues that you need to overcome uh, as a buyer. So that might be merger control issues, uh, which can be a challenge uh, in some jurisdictions. You've also got to then think about things like um, the integration issues after a business has been bought and particularly if you need to reshape the, uh, the workforce um, in some environments that can be a challenge. <coughs> and you've also got to think about things like um, tax rates and how you structure the transaction. You know, is it, is it going to leave you as a buyer with cash that may be trapped in, say, a European asset that, that can't be utilised as well? One of the key things you try and sort of sell to the shareholders is the opportunity for them to roll into Nuco and get another opportunity of value in three, four, five years time. Whereas often with a trade buyer, there might be more cash up front in the transaction and there might possibly be an earn out, possibly paper, but actually to stay in an unquoted vehicle where they're in control with a large chunk of equity is possibly a bit more seducing for them and attractive. If you're looking at something where you've got a corporate seller or even a private equity house where the, everyone is pretty much selling, then price becomes the main metric. And we're not afraid of being involved in that sort of auction process for the right asset, but actually there are other parts of the market, subscale assets, a little bit immature in terms of their platform, where you're not going to pay up at a sort of premium but you're going to look to press other buttons around being a supportive partner, being more than just money, uh, and structuring it in such a way that the, you know, the, the EV of the business isn't the sort of be-all and end-all. I think m and is going to be, in, from a European landscape perspective, probably going to be the slightly more the staples. So you're going to see consumer internet much more consolidation plays uh, in Europe coming through much more in the continent than you'll probably see in the UK, but you will see some level of act activity, maybe some level of cross-border activity also. 
That's one. The second is the, the much more standard software players, which tend to be a M a stable in Europe. I think that you're definitely going to see, you know, and it'll probably increase um, in 2015. The third sector is any kind of cloud services and IT infrastructure. I think it's much more the IT infrastructure, less the cloud services will be an M&A focus area in 2015. In this year, with consolidation happening, there will be more of it. I'm really hoping that you'll see European buyers, not necessarily American buyers, make acquisitions which are less financially focused and much more focused on the product and the technology realm. That's a little more of a hope than, you know, at this moment, a definite prediction is going to happen.